Educate, inspire, change. Educate yourself, inspire others, change the world. Today, we're doing a very special Facebook Live because Educate, Inspire, Change and the Open Centre are collaborating. And we're going to be partnering to bring some educational programmes to our audience and uh, this fall and in the future. And um, I'm sitting with Dr. John Bilyeu. Thank you for joining us, John. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm very privileged to have you on as a guest today, John. Um, uh, you are a world-renowned speaker, composer, pianist, naturopathic doctor. You've also pioneered a technique called biosonic repatterning, a natural method of healing and consciousness development using tuning forks and other sound modalities based on the sonic ratios inherent in nature. Uh, welcome to the podcast, John. How are you today? Thank you. It's, a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we had a bit of issue getting online, but we finally made it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, just give me some insight into yourself, John. What's your background? And, and obviously, I, I, I've listed all the details that, that you um, are expertise yeah. in. Just give me a bit of your background. Well, my background originally, from a very early age, was I was my I had a love of sound, and I had a love I, and when I grew up, there was no such thing as electronic instruments. We had an old piano. And I began to play it very young, and I had no idea what I was doing. I just fell in love with the sound. Uh, later, I, of course, I learned my aunt was a graduate of Chicago Music Conservatory, and she trained me uh, formally. Uh, then I went to, to school to learn music, and also at the same time, I was studied psychology. Uh, and I became interested in the heal and how music and sound affected people through my study in psychology. Um, and when I got out of school, my graduate school, I got my doctorate in psychology, and I went to work for Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital in New York City, uh, doing research and also as a therapist. Uh, and during that time, I did uh, more studies in naturopathic medicine, and I, I've studied in, uh, in American naturopathic medicine in Europe and in India. I've studied all over the world. Uh, with different teachers. Uh, I'm a licensed physician and psychologist, uh, and I'm also a composer and a musician. Uh, and basically, somehow, it just keeps coming together for me, and I've dedicated the last 50 years of my life uh, to helping people better understand how sound and music can heal and mm -hmm. help them in their life. Beautiful. And so we're here today to talk about a specific course that you're um, running at, at the Open Centre. Can you tell me more about this course and how it's structured, please? Yes, uh, the Open Centre program is in, in sound and music uh, integration, basically. Uh, it's a program that I was involved with from the beginning. Uh, it's been around, I don't know, I, it's been so many years I've lost track. It was really, at the beginning, it was avant-garde, it was the cutting edge. No one had ever heard anything like it. Uh, it's still the best program of its kind, but basically when I learned, I was like always by myself. Uh, I had to go, go someplace to find, there was no internet, I had to find all these different people, read these different books who, who knew about sound or knew about music. And in the Open Center program, what they've done is they've taken some of the best, the best teachers in the world and they've given them a platform to speak and teach so when you take the program, it's like what, what, what took me years is compacted into this one program. Uh, it, it sure makes things a lot easier and you're working with experts in the field. And I'm really, my part of the program is one part, I, I, I consider myself a member of a team of highly dedicated people. And we actually all come from music and sound and the healing arts in different ways. So you get and what happens is in the end it's like a crystal with different faucets you begin to be attracted to different areas uh, at one time and later in your life something could have happened you didn't like at that time but all of a sudden it makes sense to you so yeah. you get all this download of, 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 of really high quality information uh, that will be with you for the rest of your life it's, it's a very very special program I'm totally fascinated in this. So can you tell me a little bit more about the importance of sound and frequency and how this actually uh, helps us heal on a scientific level? Well, we could do it. You know, it's, it's basically, that's one of the problems that we've had is that the Western science really didn't pay it. They, they think of music as entertainment, 
uh, they didn't really understand vibration. Where if you go back into ancient cultures, uh, everything was based on list, deep listening or what we call today mindful listening. Uh, they understood in a different terminology than we would today. Uh, modern science really, in the larger picture, uh, has, it's pretty clear that, that, that the world, the universe that we live in is a vibrational universe. The, the common term is the quantum is used, but the word quantum just means to quantify vibration. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Vibration. Uh, so therefore we are vibrating beings. Uh, we are vibrating from the micro, which would be at a quantum level, to the macro, which is me talking with you now. And if I were to go to my piano back there and press, it's got a, a octaves. So if I pressed a low key to a high key and one represented, one represented the micro, one the macro, they'd all be connected. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, this idea that the quantum isn't connected to the macro level of life is ridiculous. I think that's been refuted by every scientist I know. Uh, it was just in the beginning, the original people who discovered that the world is vibrational had, they discovered it quantitatively, but they had no way to internalize it in their consciousness. So they actually, both of them went to India to study sound uh, and meditation and mantras and so on, and to, to be able to internalize that which they had discovered through mathematics and numbers, what they had quantitized. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for in music and sound is the integration of both science and the integration of inner experience. So they're not separate. Uh, it's, it's, and so therefore, when you learn to mindfully listen, uh, you want to apply it both in a scientific way and an artistic way. In other words, science should inform art and art should inform science. Uh, I, myself, in my work, I'm doing uh, biochemical, I've d I actually have done biochemical research uh, on the way sound affects molecules in the body uh, and what could happen. I can talk more about that if you want, uh, but I think that each presenter will also talk about their artistic and their scientific understanding of sound. Do you want me to talk about the biochemistry for a moment? or? Sure, please, go ahead. Okay, so there's sound, when it, there's certain frequencies of sound that when you listen, listen to them or you put them on the body, if it's called vibroacoustic, uh, they will cause uh, a molecule in your body called nitric oxide. That's one nitrogen and one oxygen combined. Uh, and they, that molecule makes a gas uh, called nitric oxide. Now, most people want to think nitrous oxide, that's what the dentist gives you, <laughs> but that's Two, that's different. This is one, mo one nitrogen, one oxygen. Uh, and when that molecule happens, your body has something called a relaxation response. Uh, that means that your body actually makes molecules called anandamide. Ananda means bliss. So that's, that's the, the scientific name of these molecules is anandamide. And that creates this unbelievable sense of wellness in your body. And while that's happening, your nitric oxide is enhancing your immune system, your endothelial tissue, basically your heart, your blood vessels, you know, and your neuronal tissues, your nerves. Uh, when, and that molecule functions and basically it rises and falls as a gas in a rhythm, so it's rhythmic. So when that molecule is flatlined, when there's no rhythm, it's, it's rhythmic and now all of a sudden it's flatlined, when that happens, it's a precursor to heart disease, autoimmune disease, uh, depression, uh, different psychiatric disorders, uh, colon disorders, uh, heart, you know, it, it's, it's basically a precursor to most every disease you could think of. So in a way, when you listen to sound mindfully and you listen to sound correctly, and especially uh, the sounds that I use, which you see uh, primarily is with tuning forks as a daily practice, you're really training your body and your nervous system to be what we call neurocoherent. And when you're neurocoherent, your body is naturally creating molecules that are going to be immune enhancing. They're gonna help your nervous system be calm and they're basically gonna make you stronger and better. Uh, one of the problems we have with COVID, for example, is that everybody says, what, you know, you know, what, what do I do in terms of a vaccine but nobody talks about how could I be more healthy, right? And so 
one of the things I like to do with one of the ways we could work with sound, it really will spike this molecule. It will go back into rhythm. And I like to say that in your brain, nitric oxide is a signaling molecule, and your brain will make all kinds of good chemicals. So instead of having to go to the drugstore, I'd like to say that your brain is nature's drugstore. Uh, you know, and then as these chemicals cascade through your body, uh, they will take care of, uh, like for instance, nitric oxide scientifically is antiviral, antibacterial, uh, and anti-tumor. Right? So your body then knows what to do because you're, you're, you're no longer, you're in this deep state of, 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 of a productive relaxation. I call it being in tune. You're in tune. You're coherent. So therefore, you take care of yourself naturally. And sound has the instant ability to put you into that state. Beautiful. So it sounds like this course, you really go deep into the science of, of how sound heals the body. And um, I would love to know just a little bit more about how the course is structured. So you tell people, you teach people about the science behind how sound heals them. And then you also teach them the practical side, how they can actually use different instruments uh, uh, to, to heal. Well, I actually have a formula that I teach. It's basically the formula is a three part. It's basically neurocoherence, mm -hmm. neuroplasticity, and self-regulation. And neurocoherence, I say, would be being in tune. Uh, athletes would have, there's different names for it, we call it. An athlete would say you're in the zone. Uh, you might say everything is together today. You know, I feel complete today. Uh, I, I feel, uh, but, you know, you, you I, I forget some of the other names, but the basically you're, you're there, you're, ce yeah, you're centered, you're, you're, you're centered. That would be that you're neurocoherent. Uh, and then what happens, of course, is I like to say that neurocoherence is the most boring state in the world because nobody can stay coherent very long because you're always going to do something to mess yourself up. It's guaranteed. So then you go neurodissonant. But the thing when you're neurodissonant, you have to know how to get back to being neurocoherent. Uh, so therefore, we have a practice with sound. I, have, I introduce a practice with sound using tuning forks that will ingrain neurocoherence in your nervous system. It's like then you could use it as a signal to bring you back to neurocoherence. But usually, in the, but in daily living, when we become neurocoherent, sometimes we have to we have to have neuroplasticity. Uh, to find that neuroplasticity is just our ability to, to create new neural networks to meet challenges in our life. So sound will incubate, it will prune new neural networks. In other words, the more sound you can listen to, the better off you are. Uh, some people say, I like classical music, I like, or whatever it may be. I think the more music you can appreciate, if you can appreciate every sound in the world as music, it's going to give you a lot more internal flexibility and neuroplasticity. So in that sense, I think of sound as yoga. Uh, some people can touch their knees, and some people can touch their toes. But if you look at your inner ears, they have muscles and they stretch just like your, your whole body does. So I could listen to a simple sound, and it's like it will bring neurocoherence, but I go out into the world and there's all kinds of horns and everything, and I may, I may go neurodissonant, but I have to, if I, then if I could learn to bring that coherence to those horns, those horns become my teachers in a way. I could sit there and honk and move and stuff and I don't tighten my body and then all of a sudden music is everywhere. Because the basis of music is sound, you know, so therefore every sound has the potential to become music. So I call that first neurocoherence, Secondly, neuroplasticity. And self-regulation, this means that we know coherence, we can lose it, and we don't panic, and we self-regulate and go back to it naturally. And so I use sound in a sense of something very simple to something very complex. Behind me, for example, I play all kinds of strange sounds, and, and I play, uh, but I would not play strange sounds in hospitals for very sick people. I would play, they could only touch their knees in yoga. And if I start saying, oh, let's go listen to har ho car horns as a meditation, that would be like touching your toes. And if I pushed them too quickly, it's not good. 
I'm interested to know more about how you can make all sound like uh, into kind of a healing sound. So you mentioned horns. So like, um, is there any sound I'm interested to know that you would say would be counter counter healing that wouldn't heal you? Like I know people maybe might classify a hard heavy metal music but, as something <laughs> something that's not healing. But are you saying that you can tune into that music in a different way and it's actually turn? Absolutely, it's how you listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's just think when I grew up. Uh, I, I, I lived, you know, I, I grew up in southern Indiana and I actually in Georgia and my uncle was a contractor and he took me to uh, his, uh, the, the, his black workers who played the blues. Now this is in 1959 and I'm, I'm 11 years old and I never heard it before. I've never heard people bending notes. I'd only learned classical music and straightforward music and I'm sitting there uh, and they're drinking white lightning, playing the guitars, and the harmonicas are going. And there's, remember, there's no electronic instruments then, no pitch wheels, no, everything is like, you know, and I'm going, and I thought, I felt the energy come up my spine from this music. And I was just like in heaven. I just couldn't, and I learned to play the harmonica. I, I got really good in the harmonica, and because I was so excited about it. And I went home to my parents, and I started bending notes in the harmonica, and they said, don't do that, that's the devil's music. Right, so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, but I listened to it, and I thought it wasn't the devil, I thought it was like, you know, God come to earth. Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing with Elvis Presley, years ago they had Elvis Presley, they could only show him for the waist down on TV, because yeah, yeah. they said, you know, and, and so every music that you can't listen to, you need to stretch to listen to it. That's all I'm saying. So everything has the potential to be divine. And that's mm -hmm. yoga, by the way. If it's, it's a unity of all. So therefore, how could you say that that's not divine? You just, you just don't have the ability to be coherent with it and mm -hmm. encompass it with your ears. That's all. That's really fascinating. I'm also interested to know, like, um, often when people are women are pregnant, uh, people advise them and recommend them to play classical music to their children. Right. Is there any science to this? And based on what you're saying, I'm assuming there is. There's no science to it. There's no. Uh, no. Basically, I get I teach midwives and stuff, and and I, I've, I've seen hundreds of I've I've dealt with hundreds of pregnancies, and basically what the, and the research shows that whatever music you like and you relax with and and it's good for you, you're not tightening your body, it's going to be good for your baby. But think about it. What if you what if somebody loves like. Uh, New Age music, or they love they love rock and roll, and they hate classical. What, 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 if the, uh, best example if I go to India, right? Because mm -hmm. I went to India, and they told me that the piano was the devil's instrument. They hate the piano, and so I, if I had a pregnant Indian woman, I said, "Listen to Chopin," she might go like this. It would be good for her baby. But if I That's said, nice. you, know, "You know, listen to them bending notes on a 24 foot, I mean, 24 s note scale in raga," mm -hmm. that. Be, if I gave that to, to some some uh, some opera lover here in America, never heard it. They probably think it was the devil's music. Mm -hmm. So really, it has to do with your relationship with the sound. And if your relationship with the sound is harmonious, then mm -hmm. your relationship with the music will be coherent and harmonious. Beautiful. That's a good answer. It definitely makes sense. So tell me, how long is this course last for that you're running at the Open Center? Well, this, the SMI program. Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I think it's. Ten weeks. We'd have to double check with their schedule, uh, okay. and I think they have it every month. And everybody gets supervision uh, in between. And there's there's great mentors and so on that are going uh, in between the teachers. So you're constantly have the ability to ask questions, to be supervised, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, I keep track of the students too. I think every teacher does because we want everybody to learn. Uh, it's exciting for us. This is what we do. So. Yeah, awesome. So just for everyone that's listening to this Facebook Live, I, I've pinned our link uh, on, into the comment section of this Facebook Live, and you can go there and you can use the code CASH100, which will give you $100 off the price of the SMI total program. So uh, back to you, John. Um, in 2020, obviously, we were during this very unusual time in our lives where COVID is everywhere. People are on lockdown. And I'm just curious to know that um, people are obviously interested in perhaps healing themselves more now than ever. What can people do now in the comfort of their own homes to contribute well, to their own healing? Yeah. yeah, I'll show you what I teach with sound and I, and I can add to it also. Uh, basically, what I pioneered starting in 1973 was the use of tuning forks. Uh, and the tuning forks are 
really the quantification of sound, because we could have exact frequencies. So if I hold up these two tuning forks, very simple, we tune our instruments. <coughs> so I said, why not tune ourselves? And at that time, in 1973, I was working at Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital in a lab. I had my own lab. And in the lab, there was a room in the corner, a little, another little room. And that room was called an anechoic chamber. It meant a chamber, it's a room of complete silence when you go in, developed by engineers. Later, I found out it was put there by the CIA in the 1950s for experiments. I don't know what they were experimenting with, but it was put by the CIA there, probably interrogation or deprivation. <coughs> but I knew from a composer, John Cage, that if I went in this room and sat down in, in, in total scientific silence, I would begin to hear sounds. I'd hear a high-pitched sound of my nervous system, a low-pitched sound that was my blood and circulation. And so I spent hours, sometimes hours, just sitting in this room listening to the sounds in my body. And one day, because it was New York City, I had an argument with somebody. And I went into the anechoic chamber afterwards. And my nervous system, the sound used it's, it's a high pitch like this. And it's mm -hmm. usually smooth. <coughs> but when I went into the chamber that time, and I sat down in a matter of seconds, my nervous system was like, like this was just going like this and I was and I felt like this and I didn't even what amazed me was I didn't know how much it had affected me in that way I got feedback I had a baseline and I got feedback and right at that moment I got the idea I need to be tuned I'm like a string and I'm too tight right because tuning can't be too loose or too tight it's got to be just right <coughs> so I ran downstairs to a music store, which is New York City. There's a music store downstairs, and I knew from my music training that I wanted these two tuning forks. And I knew I wanted two because of the relationship between the two. In ancient times, the C and the G relationship was, it's, uh, it's like a perfect fifth in music today. This is called the perfect balance of yin and yang, these two sounds, when they sound together. Also, the perfect dance in India of Shiva and Shakti. So I knew the ancient history so I ran down, I got them, I came back up to the chamber, and I tapped them on my knees. Let's see if I can show you back here. So I tapped them like this, and I brought them to my ears. Like so. It looked look like this. If I hum them, I go. And it becomes a one minute to a minute and a half meditation. <coughs> and the science that we did was showing that this immediately spikes the nitric oxide in your body. So if you become neural... Uh, neural dissonant. Basically, if you just do this in the morning and at night with a good thought, your nervous system goes, this happens to me in the anechoic chamber, it goes <coughs> that, that quickly. And in the laboratory, when we had the, we had uh, tissue that was flatlined nitric oxide, and we <coughs> put this tuning fork on which on the side of a petri dish, which is vibrating the similar tone. We put it on and on the graph, on the, on, the, on the wave showing the nitric oxide, it was flat. And in a matter of a microsecond, it spiked. The biochemist that I was working with said that was impossible. Uh, we, did it to, we went to two outside labs, came back, did it again. And finally, we said, yes, this is the case. Uh, and then you start reading the ancient, uh, like Inyat Khan and some of the ancient people with sound, they all said sound is amazing because it's immediate. And so therefore, I encourage people for COVID especially, or just in general, because sometimes in our modern world, you say you need to meditate for half hour. Who can do that, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and if I tell my patients, meditate for even 10 minutes, they can't do that. Because then they start feeling like failures because they didn't do it every day. 
Uh, and then I have to work with depression because they didn't do the meditation. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, basically, I want something simple everybody can do. And all you do is you tap and go like so. You know, and then you meditate for a minute and with a good thought. And then it's over and you go to sleep. You wake up, you go like this mm -hmm. and you meditate for a minute and you go. Uh, now, if you are, have trouble... You can tap on your knees, or you can tap on some people, something hard rubber. We use something like this. It makes a tap, or apples. And if you want to do it, you can also do a moving meditation. <coughs> so I'm going to back up a little bit. I'll show you the moving meditation. Sure. So if I'm, a lot of times, if I'm like, like sometimes we're like, we're like this at the end of the day. We don't even know that we're wound up and tight. So we have sometimes things like Qi Kung and so on that help us move. Now we just add sound to it. And we just keep moving like this. And we get our joints loose yeah. so that waves can move through us. Um, the other way I, can, I think I could show everybody is that and how sound heals. Let's say that most people don't know that you have a tail, but back here you have a bone called the coccyx bone. It's actually your primitive tail, and it moves. So if you could actually externalize it, if you're happy, you would look like this, <laughs> and your tail be wagging. But we know when doggies are happy, they run up like this. But when doggies are traumatized, they tuck it like this, right? And so basically, when you're, when you're at the end of the day and you're all tight like this, it's really good to move and I can tell people you can tap and move with the sound, and then you can just sit and put it, bring it to your ears. The whole thing would take more than a couple, no more than a couple minutes, mm -hmm. and you're going to have this. The science shows what's going to happen internally, but it's amazing. This is an inner experience, so easy to do. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, thank you for the demonstration there. It's really opened my eyes to the uh, healing potential of sound. And we've got a comment from a few comments here. Someone says the future of medicine is sound. So like, uh, obviously, like um, uh, what you're, you're telling me today, there's scientific backing for this. Where do you see the future for this? So, for example, people who want to do this course, they, they will receive a certificate. Yes. How, might, how might they use a certificate in a profession um, to, to then make a career? Well, I think that's... I would first think of yourself first. I tell people, heal, heal thyself, right? And then you learn and you experience. And then, but the nice thing about sound is, and music, it's universal, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, it'll integrate with any profession. It integrates with me. It integrates for me as a composer, integrates for me as a, as a physician, and integrates as a psychologist. I use it in my practice. I've done it for 50 years. Uh, again, you can integrate it into any healing art, massage, it really goes well in massage, into Reiki. Uh, uh, you could, I have lawyers who integrate it <laughs> into their practice to calm their patients down. I have, I have special things. I have actually made a bell that judges can ring instead of hitting those gavels like that. It's a bell they hit, they tap, and they say the whole courtrooms change. Because mm -hmm. uh, immediately everybody relaxes rather than goes like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so. The, the main thing is here is that the sound is, well, this, you name it, you can integrate it with it. You can integrate it in your home. You can integrate it in your life. It could be a daily practice. It could be done with patients. Uh, I use, and I only, primarily, I just like, I, I make a lot of different tuning forks for neuroplasticity, but for tuning, I just like these two and this one. And you could also have recording that I give for free people could use. Uh, <coughs> and yeah, and I think that also when you learn to listen, the key is listening. And when you learn to listen correctly, like I say, all sounds have the potential to be healing. All sounds. It's just a matter of, uh, like all stretches in yoga could be healing. It's just a matter of how far and how you use them. I love that. We've also got another comment um, from Samuel Austin asking, what sort of examples have you seen directly from sound healing? In terms of, have you seen people heal directly from the use of sound? Well, Let's, let's do the word healing, all right, because uh, <coughs> there's curing and there's healing. Mm. And, uh, so if you want to ask me if I've seen, and I integrate this as, as, a, as, a, as a doctor, I integrate sound with science. And sound becomes something I might use with other therapies to integrate them. 
and I've definitely found that uh, all my patients in general, when you teach them neurocoherence and they have a daily practice, one of the problems with medicine is that we think we give some, there's this idea of pills will help you in a way. They, they help, they may, they may be cure something, they don't necessarily, but they don't necessarily heal you. Healing means to be whole and complete. There's a difference. Um, it means to be of sound mind and sound body. So therefore, I integrate my work with the daily practice to keep people involved in the work on their own healing. And then I may work directly with a headache. For example, if I'm working with migraines or something like that, uh, just doing this, I know that this in the side of your ears is a, 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 it goes into your vagus nerve, uh, hits all the ear acupuncture points. Uh, you know, it will then go directly to the vagus nerve all the way down to your stomach. And actually, migraines start from usually colon problems and not necessarily from a tightness up here. Um, I integrated a lot with, with touch work, with what we call uh, hands-on body psychotherapy. Uh, and I have this what I use, uh, uh, this tuning fork for. I could put it directly on bones or muscles. So if somebody's up like this with their shoulder, right, I could take the tuning fork, put it on, and when it vibrates, it's the shoulder drops, right? But, that, but you think, oh, well, the wave is right here. But I could actually put this tuning fork on top of my head without knowing its frequency. I could put a special meter on my big toe and I can measure the exact frequency because the wave goes to my whole body. It's the strongest at the point you put it at. I've suffered from bad sleeping patterns for years. And that's why I was delighted to come across a great company called Ra Optics. Ra Optics is a blue light blocking company that's owned by my now dear friend Matt Maruka. As a kid, Matt himself suffered from debilitating headaches, allergies and gut issues and that's why he started researching healing modalities. It was during his research that he discovered the importance of natural light for the human body and I'm really glad that he did this research because I've been benefiting from these glasses myself for the last year. I've been wearing them day and night when using computers and I can honestly say that these glasses have helped me improve my sleep and quality of life. That's why I'm recommending with extreme confidence that you check out his website, ratoptics.com, and use the code EIC15 for an amazing 15% discount on your first purchase. And not only are these glasses great for your health, they look really cool too. In the name of Anthony Walsh, who handed me a bottle of hemp extract CBD oil. And after just taking a few drops, I was sold. I immediately felt more relaxed, less stressed. I found the quality of my sleep improved and it even helped me with my meditation practices. The reason this product stands out for me was Anthony himself is passionate about healing the world one person at a time and has personally invested thousands of hours researching CBD and cannabinoids in order to fully understand how to help guide others to receive the maximum benefits of taking hemp oil extracts. His company is called Eco Life Supplements and I highly recommend it to anyone that wants to have a better, happier and healthier life. It's 100% natural. Organically grown, all natural and non-GMO guaranteed for your best experience. To order yours now, please visit ecolifesupplements.com and quote coupon code INSPIRECHANGE for a 10% discount and they are currently only delivering in the US. So it sounds to me that people who do this course with SMI, not only are they picking up the tools uh, to heal themselves and to integrate this beautiful sound healing into their own lives, they can also then go forth and apply these teachings or these methods in their, in their, in their professional life as well. That's correct. You know, but you have to have good boundaries. So I wouldn't go out and tell someone, you know, I'm going to you know, heal cancer after this course. course. But, if you're, but if you're an oncologist who's taken the course, then you can integrate it to your oncology practice. If you're a psychiatrist, a psychologist, you can integrate it to that practice. In fact, uh, we have many professionals take the course uh, and they, once you're in the course, you begin to put all the, your experiences and information together and then you create, that's the neuroplasticity of the course. You see, you discover new ways of expressing the work. Uh, mm -hmm. And I like to tell my students, if you do it the way I do it, something's wrong. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I can demonstrate, I, I want to inspire you to create things that I couldn't even possibly have imagined, and I'll be very happy. That's beautiful. Beautiful. And I just want to remind people where to go to check out this course. They can visit opencenter.org forward slash sound 2020 
forward slash cash and you can enter in the code cash 100 for a hundred dollar discount off the total smi program so uh, tell me again john how many years have you have you been working with open center yourself i've been working with the open center since the beginning oh wow uh I'm not sure when that was. <laughs> it's going to be a long time ago. <laughs> it's long like three or four lifetimes ago, maybe. <laughs> it seems like 20, 25 years ago. I'm not sure. More than that, actually. Uh, uh, it has been 30. Whenever it began, I was there. Uh, I've been not with this program, but I was teaching. I was doing concerts. I was giving my own individual classes. And yeah. then the SMI program developed, and mm -hmm. I became part of that. Beautiful. And obviously in the past, all of this was done in person, but now due to COVID and, and recent changes, it's, uh, the course is now being offered online. Yeah. And, and in terms of the online course, it's live video calls, Zoom calls uh, yeah. throughout the month, and, and people can actively engage with their teacher and ask questions. And then at the end of it, they receive a certificate. What, what's the, what does on the certificate, if you don't mind me asking, so uh, what do people I don't know. Do? <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen. I don't have it. All right. Okay. I got it the hard way, so I don't have the paper. I understand. I <laughs> I'm understand. sure it says something good in the New York Open Center. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure uh, it but, does. But the main thing is that it's a certificate from a recognized yeah. uh, organization, you know, yeah. and, that's, uh, and that's very, very important, I think, mm -hmm. for anybody in professional practice. And, and, your, and your expertise, which profession specifically do you think would be most suited to, to taking up this kind of course? Well, I think definitely uh, anybody in body work or massage is going to be really pick it up really quickly. Uh, I think anybody in medicine, I think uh, if you, if you, if you, if you, because it'll be experiential and science and there'll be, I have probably more science in some ways, but basically it's going to be, you're going to have really good therapists that are working in hospitals that are teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to have more artists that are teaching. In other words, sometimes classes will be more artist based sometimes more, a little more science-based. And there's always this kind of balance between art and science, you know, yeah. inner and outer, so to speak. Or I like to say quantitative and qualitative. Mm. So, and everybody, and they come in, is a little different. Some people, I like to say, are more intuitive, and some people are less. So the idea would be to have this good balance between science and intuition. Mm -hmm. And I think some classes are like, will tilt one way, some others way, and that's what makes it so good. Mm -hmm. Right, in a way, because something in there is going to attract you. Uh, it, we can go into shamanism and sound. You can go, like I've been talking about biochemistry and sound, yoga and sound, and mantras. Because and, sound has been everywhere in everything uh, forever, basically. I'd, I'd love to, you, you brought up sh shamanism there. I'd love to touch on that, if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, and In the last couple of years, I've been working closely with shamans and uh, different plant medicines. And often these shamans, they are uh, uh, using uh, echoes or songs to yeah. help guide people through their journeys. And yeah. so this, I sat in these journeys myself, and it completely fascinates me how sound and uh, uh, they can use the sound, their voice to really transform the energy in the room. I'd love to know your expertise on this. Is, is there any insight you have on that? Well, I think I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I exactly. It's just a matter of what name you want to put on it. Uh, yeah. I'm helping people on their journeys. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the context of the cultural context you want to put it in. Yeah. Um, you know, so I've kind of like, one of my goals has been to integrate the ancient, the shamanistic, and the modern, uh, and, and, and put them together so that they're kind of like balancing like this. So I also have studied with many shamans. Uh, I, you know, and I consider myself a shaman in a way. It's just that if I went into the hospital and said that, they'd throw me out. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean I'm not. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's esoteric knowledge. It was originally called secret knowledge. Mm. So it's the knowledge of vibration. And when we, when we say mus vibration to me is really the medicine of now, not the future. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, again, we have to look at and realize that we're, we're always dealing with the politics of healing. So the idea of pills make more money than vibration, you know, so, but soon or later things begin to surface. I like to say cream rises to the top. So we're all, vi eventually all this vibrational knowledge will come to us in a quantified and an artistic way. We'll, we'll begin to balance it out. Beautiful. Uh, you, you mentioned like we're sharing a lot of ancient knowledge here that has been practiced probably for thousands of years. Uh, wh which kind of um, ancient cultures practice sound healing to your knowledge? Every one of them. Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. 
Everybody did. It was, it was central. The only place that it's not central is in Western medicine. Really? Uh, it's in central in alchemy. It's central in Ayurveda. Uh, the Nada Bindu Upanishads basically is sound. Everything's focused on sound and mind. Deep listening, they call it. Mm-hmm. It's central in, in, the, uh, in, in acupuncture, oriental medicine. It's central uh, in naturopathic homeopathy, uh, vibrational medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it comes under different names. And that's one of the problems is that there's so many different names and so much history with it that the modern scientists can sit and think they, they just can't weed their way through it. They call it, they're, they're th- they call it qualia in terms of consciousness that uh, it's the one thing they can't quantify uh, yeah. is inner experience. But at the same time, the shamans had this un- unbelievable ability to basically be with inner experience and be guides at the same time, they were, they were really understood quantification in their mm-hmm. own way. Mm-hmm. So when the Nada Bindu Upanishad, they use the word sound. Uh, they say the state of s- there's a state higher than sound. But if you look at sound waves, they make there's a wave and there's a node. And a node in sound is nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a place where there's no sound, there's nothing. Right? And every sound has within it nodes. Mm. And so... When, when one is deep listening, you go to this place above the sound. It doesn't mean the sound disappears, but you're no longer attached to the wave and the frequency. You know, and that's what's, that's what's called a higher state of consciousness in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and the, the shaman in, in the Castaneda books, for example, he talks about, everybody thinks the Castaneda books are about seeing, but actually Castaneda had to go home and for 12 years straight without seeing his teacher, he had to only listen. He had to use his ears. And then he went back and his teacher had a, a spirit catcher, a rope. He went like this and made waves and, and sound. And Castaneda was able to enter into the holes in the sound, into the nodes, and mm-hmm. use them as passageways into other realities. Wow. Uh, and by the way, in the Castaneda books, they don't, only in the first book did he use drugs. After that, they never used drugs, only sound. Wow, that's amazing. Yep. And, and so obviously, like, um, we live in the modern age, and modern music seems to be so far distant from this kind of sacred understanding of music. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think this kind of sound healing isn't more prevalent in modern music? Or is it, and we're just not recognizing well, it? Well, I think that the, in, 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 there's different ways by modern music. I know... Uh, but in, in the avant-garde music, like John Cage, the composers I studied with in Zanakis were all very spiritual. Uh, you know, John Cage said, every something is an echo of nothing, uh, which is really every wave is an echo of a note. Uh, and my, my composition teacher, Ines Zanakis, was a Greek composer who was very much in touch with Greek history. Mm-hmm. Uh, in World War II, uh, he was shot by the, by the, by the Nazis He's in a hospital recuperating, and he had these visions that he was in ancient Greece, and he was told to come back and bring this knowledge of sound to the world as a composer. But he was an architect, an engineer, so he basically said, okay, I'm a composer now, and he he developed mathematical music, and he built buildings based on musical ratios and intervals. Uh, So if you mean like heavy metal and things like that, I mean, there's, as you know, everything to me has the possibility of the divine. So, uh, I, 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 for instance, I used to go to the Ramon concerts and jump up and down and bank, you know, fall backwards. Uh, <laughs> I, I went, I, I went to all, I learned how to street rap on New York City streets with the rappers. Uh, I go, there's no such things to me as the bad music. I want to, I want, if, in fact, if I think it's, if it's, it's a bad music, I want to learn how to be safe and relax with it and learn mm-hmm. it. I love your open-minded approach to that. It's very refreshing, I have to say, because people often can categorize music in so many ways. And uh, the fact that you've got so much wealth of knowledge in this and you're open-minded to all different types of music, and it really is just down to your own perception, how you perceive it will define the effect that it has on you. So I really do love that. I I also have a question. Uh, We've got a comment in here from Samuel asking, is it true that most modern music is tuned into 440 hertz instead of 432 hertz? And is that why 432 is so revered? Do you have any knowledge on this? Yes, I do. In fact, on my website, there's in the uh, support section, there's articles I've written on this. Mm -hmm. I think it's more important. uh, The tuning is fine. The 432... For I tune my tuning forks to 426.1 to the Fibonacci series. Uh, 
And remember, in ancient times, nobody had tuning forks, nobody had frequencies, so nobody knows what anybody tuned to. Uh, the, the idea of 431 or 432 is, uh, four, is, is relatively new. Uh, it actually makes a very strange interval in terms of tuning. Uh, I like it. Uh, I think it's, but, I, but again, I like them all. I tune tuning, I have over, you can see in my background, I have over 3,000 tuning forks here in my, in, in my studio. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have books of over, over, over 4,000 different tunings used for the last 2,000 years. Uh -huh. uh, the main thing is that every tuning, we could say, what's the tuning for somebody in a hospital, right? Somebody who is very sick, then I would just say something as simple as possible like this, and you could tune this, this could be a 432 to go with it if you wanted, it'd be fine. Uh, but the main thing, it has to be simple and it has to give the, the effect of the nitric oxide spiking. Uh, so I wouldn't say, whenever you try to make it that one note is better than another, you've just, it just doesn't work uh, for me. So yes, I make 432 tuning forks for people who want them, uh, but I also make other ones too. Mm -hmm. Now, my piano back there is yep. tuned to 440. Um, but why is it tuned to 440? Because uh, if you want to play with other musicians, you have to have that tuning. Mm -hmm. uh, my electronic piano, which you can't see, I can just press a button and tune it to anything, which I do. Uh, I play in four, I like, I've played Chopin in 432. I've played Chopin in 426. Hondo tuned, to four, we think, down to 427. Actually, like 424. Uh, you know, so different tunings require different possibilities mm -hmm. but let me just explain one what the if you have two tuning forks the m in other words they make a ratio what's called an interval there's a space between them that space is mathematically precise so when we go to ancient knowledge the only thing we know is not what they tuned to but the spaces that they tuned were mathematically precise so this would be a ratio of two to three, or three to two, any way you want to look at it. That's what's most important for me. That's why I have two tuning forks for this use. That's what's most important, is the space between, because it said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there shall I be. In other words, you have these two sounds, and your brain will put them together into coherency. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, this has been a real uh, eye-opener for me, so thank you so much for all your insight and your wisdom, John. Uh, I'm interested to know, you've got a, a wealth of instruments there behind you. What what's some of the more obscure instruments that you work with? Oh, uh, I, I, I have thousands in my studio here. I don't know about obscure. Uh, yeah. Actually, there, there's someone who teaches, when, and part of the SMI training, they oftentimes have my friend Thomas Workman come in, and he has ancient instruments from all over. He's like... Uh, he's beyond belief, actually, <laughs> with all the instruments that he has. I can't even begin to compare to him. Uh, mm. But I can show you one of the things I use that might, you might find interesting. Please. Uh, this one instrument here, uh, is what's happened is that when I go to my transfer, my, what we call the dump, my transfer station, people are throwing out pianos now. And so, I would take, I, I'd actually take pianos and give them a new life. So what this is, is a piano lyre, the inside of a piano mm -hmm. that I mounted so you could actually play it. And you say, well, I don't want to play tunes, I want to play sounds. That's what, mm -hmm. we want to have a sound healing journey. Mm -hmm. So if I play it, and anybody can do this, you don't need musical training. It's very important that you listen and have a relationship with sound, soft and loud and so on but you don't want to have a relationship necessarily with musical, traditional Western harmony and things like that. So if I have this, I can go. Thank you for that, John. That was really interesting sounds there. Yeah, they're fun. And we get groups together, and it's amazing. You have someone 
who thinks they have to play music in a certain way, and you put them in front of the lyre, mm -hmm. and they could just let go and be like little children and play, and it's amazing what they come up with. I, I always I come, we say, be, li be ye like children, enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> you know, so when you go into the sound this way, and you could just get past this, it has to be a certain way. Uh, as a, a Miles Davis said in Art Tatum, there's no such thing as a wrong note. Uh, mm. You just go into the sound and you don't think notes. Mm. You just think sound and you enjoy. Beautiful. I love that so much. Thank you. And I appreciate you doing the demonstration for us as well. Uh, obviously, we've been speaking about a, a broad range of subjects. The one that really piques my interest the most is this esoteric uh, ancient wisdom and its relation to vibration and sound. And I'd just love to know, like, what uh, particular, is there any books you would recommend or anything, anywhere you recommend I search to find out more about the ancient use of sound and vibration with healing? Uh, well, I think Inyat Khan's book, um, gosh, I forgot the title. Can you give me the mm -hmm. book there being the, the yellow one? Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of my favorites ever. Um, mm -hmm. It's what it ex actually, I'll hold it up, it's called The Mysticism of Sound and Music. Look, if you, I don't know if you can see his picture, isn't he beautiful? Mm -hmm. I mean, he says he gave up his vinya because he heard music everywhere and he wanted to share it with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just, it's, it, uh, that's, that book to me is so beautiful for an ancient knowledge of sound. Uh, and mm -hmm. so clear. Uh, Thank you. So that would be my primary recommendation right there. Thank you. I'll definitely be sure to pick that up. So, John, obviously, like, uh, I appreciate all your time today. Uh, I feel like I could talk to you for hours and hours because you've got so much to share. I love your energy as well. I love the instruments you've been playing. I'm really grateful to you. Is there anything else that you think you'd like to share with my audience? Just to, if anyone's thinking about this SMI program but they're not sure, what, what would you say to them? Uh, well, I'd say that if you, if you love, no, I need the human tuning. If you love sound mm -hmm. and if you love music and they mean something to, to you in your life, mm -hmm. this is what you ought to do. <laughs> you won't regret it, I guarantee you. Uh, I would not think so much about how you're going to integrate it uh, or how you're going to use it as a profession. It's something that you, would do, you should do for yourself. Mm -hmm. It should be downloaded into you. And then you should sit with it, and it will it'll be like a seed that will grow inside of you. Uh, and that's how I view it. That's how I view my own life with sound and my relationship with sound. It keeps growing. Thank you so much for listening to the Educate Inspire Change with Cash Can podcast. Your support means a lot to me. And if you would like to continue supporting me, please follow and subscribe. We're on SoundCloud, Spotify, Facebook, YouTube, and iTunes. And please leave a positive review wherever you can. Thank you. I'm proud to say that one of the first sponsors I have for this podcast is Rhythmia Life Advancement Centre. Rhythmia is a unique and special place to me. It's a healing resort fused with ayahuasca, uh, meditation, breathwork, yoga, and lots of other metaphysical teachings. And they really um, sent me on a journey of healing and self-discovery that ultimately led to the creation of this podcast. So I really do owe Rhythmia a lot. And if you would like to go there and have a healing journey of your own, please visit them on their website at rhythmia.link forward slash can, spelled K-H-A-N, or give them a call on 877-835-1806 and receive a free shuttle worth $300 off your trip.